Hey guys, welcome to my YouTube channel, Cybersecurity Ranger. So in the previous lecture, we discussed about the data plane part uh, of the network layer. And then we looked at the router architecture where we discussed the input ports and the output ports and how the routers, they use longest prefix match uh, to forward the incoming packets to the relevant output ports. Uh, so today we are going to discuss uh, the third and I would say the most important component of the routers known as switching fabrics. Now here in this picture, you can see the switching fabric uh, in this red rectangle. Now, an important thing to understand about the switching fabric is that the main job of switching fabric is that when the packet is coming into the input port, the switching fabric has to forward it to the relevant output port. But apart from that, we also need to consider the switching rate of this fabric, which means that at which rate this switching fabric is going to forward the packets to the output port. Now it depends on the input uh, ports that at what rate these ports are receiving the packets. Or in other words, what is the transmission rate of the input ports? So in this example, for instance, we can see that we have input port receiving the packets at R bits per second, and we have N number of input ports. So which means that the combined uh, transmission rate will be N cross R. Now remember that under ideal conditions, the switching fabric should have a switching rate of N cross R. Only then it will be able to forward the packets from input port to the output port without causing any delays. Now the question is that if, for instance, the switching fabric does not have the same switching rate that is N cross R, then what's gonna happen? Well, if it is less than N cross R, then obviously it means that the the, the tr transmission rate at the input port is higher than the switching fabric. So the switching fabric is slow. It cannot forward the packets at the same rate. And then it will lead to packets being queued on the input ports, right? And we'll discuss the uh, input port queuing in more detail uh, in the coming slides. Now, moving on, we have three major types of switching fabrics. We have memory-based switching fabrics, we have bus-based switching fabrics, and we have interconnection network-based switching fabrics. Let's look at these types one by one. So switching via memory, this is basically the simplest and earliest routers. They were uh, working like traditional computers with switching between input and output ports being done under the direct control of the CPU. Right, Input and output ports, they functioned just like a traditional input output device uh, with a traditional operating system. And when an input port has a packet that arrives, it will first signal the routing processor via interrupt. Then the packet will be copied into the memory. And from memory, the CPU is going to look into the header of this packet and then the CPU is going to forward the packet to the appropriate output port, right? So this is how the first generation routers, they were working, just like a traditional computer system. Now, this is obviously slow, and we can understand why it's slow, because first of all, the packet has to cross two buses, and depending upon what is the bus speed, the packet cannot be forwarded at a higher rate than that bus speed. Another limitation is also uh, the bandwidth of the memory, or in other words, the speed of the memory. So the packet will come into the memory. First, the packet will you know, signal the CPU via interrupt, then it will be copied into the memory. Then from memory, the CPU will look into the header and decide on which output port it needs to be forwarded, and the packet then will be forwarded to the output port. So the first generation routers, they were quite slow because of this uh, technique by which they were forwarding the packets. Now, the second type of uh, switching fabrics 
are switching via memory uh, via bus. Now, one thing that you can immediately notice that the CPU involvement in this switching is uh, has been removed. So now the packets which is coming into the input port is directly forwarded via this bus to the output port, right? So it removes uh, the the dependency on the CPU that it has to read and then forward. Number one. Number two. Let's assume that this is input port number one, input port number two, and input port number three. And then we have output port number one, output port number two, output port number three. So in this case, for example, if the packet is arriving at input port number one and has to be forwarded to port number two, so what will happen at the input port is that this packet will be labeled internally with an address to port number two the output port number two, right? This is apart from the destination address that will come along with the packet, okay? So we are talking about local switching within this within the router. We are switching fabric. So this packet will then be forwarded to the bus and each of these ports will receive this packet, a copy of this packet. So these Port number one and port number three are going to drop this packet because it is the address, uh, at, uh, I mean, the label does not match with these ports. So the label matches with port number two. Therefore, port number two will accept this packet and then forward it to the output link or the transmission link. Now, Cisco 5600 series routers, they uses a bus speed of 32 gigabits per second. And they are good enough for smaller organizations and can be used as the access routers, right? However, we can also see the limitation again here that the there are two, two limitations here. Number one, only one packet can be forwarded at a time, okay? So if the bus is carrying one packet from port number one, the other port, port two and port three, they cannot transmit the packet because the bus is busy. Otherwise, obviously, it will have collision if they start transmitting. So this is the first limitation that a single packet can be transmitted um, at 32 gigabits per second uh, transmission uh, rate switched between input and output port. The second limitation is that the speed of the bus depends or dictates that how fast the switching will be done. So it is limited by the uh, bus speed as well. But like I said, it's good for medium and small organizations. Uh, they are still using uh, these kind of routers. Now, the final type and the last type of uh, switching is switching via interconnection. So immediately you can see the, the difference here is that in the previous type, we had a single bus and we're in this, we have multiple buses. Um, and we also call them crossbar uh, switches. So in the crossbar switch, you can see that the number of buses is two cross n, okay? Which means that if I have three input ports, uh, we are going to have, sorry, we are going to have six buses. So we have three horizontal buses, as you can see it here. And then we have three vertical buses, which are basically intersecting these hor uh, horizontal buses at these cross points that you can see it here. Okay, now, one of the advantages of using crossbar switches is that it's obviously much faster as compared to the previous, uh, you know, switching via bus, single bus. Uh, and the reason is because now you can have, you can forward multiple packets at the same time. So for example, I have port number one, two, and three here, and these are the output ports one, output port two, and output port three. So in this case, for example, port number one has a packet that needs to be forwarded to uh, the output port number two. Now you can see here that this bus is free. So port number two can forward the packet to port number one if it is, uh, it has to be forwarded to uh, to port number one, right? Uh, so in this case, we can have more than one packets um, being, uh, you know, delivered to uh, to the two different output ports. However, if port number one and two they want to deliver a packet to port number two, uh, then in that case, only one packet can travel at the same time because Within this single bus, only one packet can be transmitted. 
multiple packets cannot be transmitted. All right. And you can also see here that these cross points in these switches, uh, uh, switching fabrics, they are basically gates that can be controlled by the internal logic of the fabric. So for example, if port number wants, wants to forward the packet to output port number two, these gates will be closed and the packet will be directly delivered from port number one to port number two. We also have multi-stage switches. Here you can see eight cross eight multi-stage switch. Uh, now you can see here that these input ports, for example, they have, they are connected through multiple switches within them by using different paths, right? Which means that a packet that is coming into the input port, first of all, it can be fragmented. This is another advantage. And these fragments, they can take different paths to reach the output port. So in this example, we can see the packet has been fragmented, takes different paths to these multi-stage switches, and then is reassembled on the output port. Now, the advantage of this uh, type of uh, switching fabrics is that you can actually uh, forward uh, multiple packets to the same output port. So if port one and port two, they want to forward it to port number one, they can take different paths and then forward these packets to the same output port, which was not possible in any of the previous switching fabrics that we have discussed. Now, Cisco uh, 12,000 series, um, Cisco 76,000 series, they basically can be used, uh, configured to either use a bus or, or a crossbar uh, switching technique. All right, having the discussion about the switching fabric, let's now uh, move on to uh, discuss uh, queuing a little bit in more detail, like why queuing happens and then um, how this queuing can be handled, what should be the size of the buffer, uh, and uh, what kind of scheduling techniques can be used. So first of all, talking about input port queuing, so if the switching fabric, like I discussed previously, is slower than the input ports combined, then we will have queuing at the input port. As you can see here and here, that we have uh, queues that are being created. Um, eventually, what will happen? Now, at the input ports, we will have a buffer space, right? Where we can uh, store these packets uh, which are incoming and the switching fabric is slow, cannot forward the packet at the same rate. So the, these packets will, you know, uh, get queued. And eventually, when the buffer is full, then a packet loss can happen, right? You can also notice in this uh, figure that at a time, only one packet, red packet can be delivered to the uh, red output port. So if this port is delivering the red packet, in that case, this red packet on port number three has to wait. It also creates another problem that the green packet, which is supposed to be delivered to the output port, which is green, and this port is completely free, not busy, uh, but still because the red packet came in first, so it has to wait. So it is being blocked, although it could be delivered. So we will see how, how the routers, they handle these, uh, these kind of issues. Another thing that you can also see is uh, head of line blocking, right? So the head of line blocking means that the packet, which is at the front, again, uh, I think I already discussed this, that the green packet is being blocked by the red packet, so we call it head of line blocking. And the second issue was that only one red packet can be delivered. So let's move on. The output port queuing can also happen. Well, the question is how? We just discussed that if the switching fabric is slow, slower than the combined rate of the input ports, then queuing will happen at the input port. Similarly, if the switching fabric is faster, is switching and forwarding the package faster, 
but the link transmission rate is low. In this case, for example, if I say that the switching fabric is switching the packets at 10 gigabits per second, whereas the link capacity is five gigabits per second, well, in that case, there will be queues that will get created at the output port, right? And then you need to buffer them. So you will start buffering the packets here. And then eventually what will happen? If the buffer is full, the packets will be lost or dropped. But the question here is that if we have to drop the packets, what should be the policy? How are we going to decide which packets should be dropped? So we'll talk about it. And another thing that we have to consider is the scheduling discipline, which means that among these packets, which are queued, are we going to process them the way they come into the into the queue and the, the first come first serve basis? I mean, the packet coming first will be served or transmitted first, packet coming second will be transmitted second, or do we have some other kind of approach? So this is what we call it the scheduling. So scheduling can be done in different ways and we are going to discuss what are the different types of scheduling mechanisms. Um, but we can also do priority scheduling. It means we can prioritize some of these packets and then they can be transmitted first. The other ones, they, they will be transmitted later. Uh, but then we have a problem of network neutrality here. Uh, just wait a second and I'm going to discuss all, all of these. All right, so the output port queuing, I already discussed why the queues will get created and eventually will result in the loss. Before we move on to discussing which packets should be dropped and on what basis, an important question that we need to ask is that how much buffer space do we need? What I mean to say is that in this router, for instance, where the queues are being created, how much should be the buffer space? Is it going to be one gigabyte? two gigabyte, 10 gigabyte, 20 gigabyte, what? So we need to look into this. According to the RFC 3439, the rule of thumb is that the average buffering should be equal to the RTT times the link capacity. So RTT is the round trip time. I mean, the time it takes for the packet to be delivered and the acknowledgement to come back. We call that as the RTT and the link capacity. So for example, in this example, if we have the link capacity of 10 gigabits per second, um, and we have an RTT of 250 milliseconds, then we need at least 2.5 gigabit of the buffer space. Well, this has been used for a long time, uh, this approach, uh, but according to the latest recommendations, now we look into the flow, the TCP flows, uh, the number of TCP flows. And the new formula or the recommendation for calculating the buffer space is RTT times C divided by the square root of N. N is the number of the TCP flows that, uh, 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 that, that you will consider. And the reason why we need to decide on how much buffer space we need, I mean, we might think that, okay, why don't we just have more and more buffer space? Well, there are lots of issues with uh, with having more buffer space. And there are also issues with having less buffer space. So buffering is, or the buffer space is like adding salt. You cannot have too less, you cannot have too much. If you have too less buffer space, then there will be more loss of packets that can happen. But if you have too much of the buffering space, then it will increase the delays uh, in delivering those, those packets, right? Another thing you have to keep in mind is that we, we did discuss about the congestion control mechanism and, and making sure that the, the link capacity is used and to the maximum, but then we slow down the, the rate of transmission when we detect a congestion on the network. So that also helps 
I mean, it's not only the buffer space that 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 is going to take care of it, but the congestion control mechanism is also taking care of uh, of uh, of these uh, packet loss that is happening, right? All right. So talking about the buffer management, like like we said that okay, when the queues are being created and the packets are getting queued, and if the buffer becomes full, then the question is which packets needs to be dropped. Well, one of the policy could be a tail, tail drop policy, which basically means that the packet which are arriving late, they can be dropped. Or we can also have another approach, which is priority-based uh, based, uh, dropping, which means that some of the packets, they can be prioritized uh, based on based on any any uh, header information. Like for instance, if I look at this packet that is coming into the router, which has a data part in it, right? It has um, a TCP header, it has an IP header, right? And it has also a link layer header, right? Now, according to the priority scheduling, you can, decide on any of these header values and then based on that you can prioritize them that okay i'm going to uh for instance consider the tcp packets having high priority and udp packets having low priority so i'm i'm deciding on the basis of this header and we can also look at the IP header, and in IP header, we have something called um, type of service. Type of service field basically is, again, used in the IP packets to prioritize. So you can uh, decide, you know, that, okay, SNMP packets are going to be, uh, be uh, having higher priority than the HTTP packets, for example. So... So based on that, we can, because SNMP, let's just say that these are the network management packets, so we are going to give them higher priority. And uh, HTTP, we can afford to, to, to lose them and afford the retransmission, right? So, so there are two ways, tail drop and priority-based scheduling, I mean, a dropping. And the packets can also be marked for congestion. So we have looked at the uh, ECN, uh, which is the explicit congestion notification, uh, which we, uh, you know, we discussed uh, before as well. That that in the uh, in the IP header, we have two bits called E bit and C bit that are used for notifying uh, the receiver that there's congestion on the router. Right. So so we can also mark these packets. Okay, talking about packet scheduling. So the previous uh, discussion was about dropping policy, that how we drop them. Now we'll discuss that, uh, how to process these packets. There are three main, uh, four main, four types of uh, packet scheduling. We have first come first serve, we have priority based scheduling, we have round robin, and we have uh, weighted fair queuing. First come, uh, first come, first serve, we also call it FIFO, is, is quite simple. And we see it in our in our real life and in our daily life as well, that when you go to purchase a ticket, for example, you get in the queue. So those who come first, they get served first. Those who come late, they get served late, right? So the same, um, the same uh, rule applies here, that the packets arriving first will be processed first. The packet arriving later will be processed late. The second type, which we call as the priority-based scheduling, we can first of all classify the traffic and you know queue them according to the class. So in this example, we have uh, red packets and we have green packets. Red packets, they have high priority. Green packets, they have low priority. So first of all, based on the header values, we can classify them and then we can queue them. And then we process the packet based on their priority. So first of all, in this example, we consider that the red packet has arrived. So the packet is now in service, means it is being processed before. And before it is transmitted, another green packet comes in. 
And then before it is, you know, the processing of the first packet is complete, we have packet number three arriving. So now the question is that once the processing of packet number one is done, it is processed and, you know, sent on to the transmission link, which packet should be processed next? Because packet two arrives before packet number three. So should we process packet two or should we process packet three? Well, according to the priority-based scheduling, packet number three is going to take priority because it has a higher priority. So we are going to process packet number three, and then we are going to process packet number two, and this thing goes on and on. Now, we also have another type called round robin. Now, in round robin, we again classify the traffic as per the header values or header fields. So here we have uh, green traffic green packets, you know, sorry, red packets, green packets, and then blue packets. Now, according to the round robin, we will process these packets. Red packets will be processed first, for example, with the highest priority. Then we process green packet, and then we process blue packets, right? So it's like cyclic. So one from each of these. First red, then green, then blue. First red, then green, then blue. Pretty simple, right? Now, weighted fair queuing is interesting. It uses the round robin, but it assigns weights to these classified traffic. So red class, for example, has the highest priority, but we give it more weight. So let's just say that we give a weight of 10 to red. We give a weight of five to green, and then we give a weight of three to the blue packets or the blue traffic. Now, what happens is that the 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 the, the traffic that has been classified as highest priority traffic, according to the weight, we are going to process it. So, in this example, we will process, for instance, ten packets from the red, right, from the red uh, traffic. Then we are going to, to process five packets from the green. Then we are going to process three packets from the blue. And then it goes back in round robin. Ten packets from red, five from... Of course, if there are these number of packets available only, then we will process that many packets. Five from the second and three from the blue. And this thing goes on. The advantage of using weighted pair queuing is that you can actually guarantee a minimum throughput to certain applications. So, for example, for a gaming application, you can give it a higher weighted and you can guarantee a certain amount of throughput. Okay. So, to summarize, we have discussed now the types of the switching fabrics. We have discussed uh, buffer management, what should be the drop policy, what are the different, uh, you know, scheduling policies. Now, remember, when we talk about scheduling, priority scheduling, then we have an issue where an ISP might, you know, decide to throttle a certain type of traffic. For instance, the ISP, and it has been, uh, you know, there has been a case uh, against an ISP uh, which was throttling the traffic of a certain uh, voice over IP because the ISP itself also had a voice over IP application. So they were deliberately throttling the traffic of another, um, you know, application because of the competition. So now the question is that, you know, how to handle this? Because we have this priority scheduling technique where you can throttle the traffic of certain applications we have the dropping policy where you can start dropping the packets. Like for instance, uh, there was a case against ISP which uh, started dropping the BitTorrent traffic and it started sending uh, TCP reset connections to the server and the clients. So we could have technical reasons by the ISP where they want to you know, apply priority scheduling and buffer management. We may have a situation where there are social and economic issues, you know, a certain type of uh, opinion is being 
is is, is being throttled by the by the ISPs. We may have uh, legal issues as well. So, 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 how do we balance this, or where, where, where is network neutrality here? Well, there are different countries who have different takes on network neutrality, and they have different laws and policies uh, for that. Uh, but for United States, uh, 2015 uh, FCC order on protecting and promoting an open internet, it has three uh, clear cut rules related to network neutrality. neutrality. The first rule is no blocking. The second rule is no throttling. The third rule is no prioritization. So no blocking basically means that none of the ISP can block the lawful content application or services which are not harmful. They cannot throttle or degrade the traffic of certain applications or services which are not harmful. And they cannot also engage in a paid prioritization. Means that if one, uh, you know, uh, application provider is, uh, you know, is uh, is trying to get a better service and get a higher priority to his traffic by paying the ISP. Uh, so, so this law it also protects uh, from paid prioritization, unless there is a reasonable reason that the ISPs have to degrade or throttle a certain traffic be, you know, because of the network management issue, right? So with this, um, we have discussed what is exactly inside the routers, input ports, output ports, um, switching fabrics, buffer management and scheduling. So I'll continue my uh, lecture in the next video. We'll talk about the uh, the internet protocol, we'll look at the data ground format, we'll look at the addressing, network address translation, and so on, right? Thank you for watching, and please subscribe to the channel and like the videos.